delete this window if I can. Set it now being streamed live on Facebook. Right, I think we are live. Just want to make sure that the, the sound on this isn't yeah, call back mute. Okay. There we are. All right. Okay, people are ready. Right. Okay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Sorry about that. We've had some technical difficulties this evening. Um, yeah. Welcome, everybody, to uh, this very special event with the Young Fabian Fame Advocacy Group. My name is Henry Mendoza. I am the chair of the Young Fabian Fame Advocacy Group. Um, yes, and as you have all gathered from, uh, from the event title, this is um, called Starmer versus Antisemitism 18 months in. Um, yeah, we felt that it was particularly pertinent to have a discussion on this. Um, well, we're, we're technically 20 months in, but that's uh, lost the test. Um, but yeah, um, as some of you may have seen, uh, particularly, uh, potentially some of you watching online as well, um, then yeah, this has had such a reaction in the last few days on Twitter. Um, which um, arguably just demonstrates the need even more so for us to have this discussion. Um, but yeah, um, tonight we have um, you know, uh, various speakers with us. Um, and we have three speakers with us in the room uh, from JLM, and we have uh, Stephen Bush as well, um, you know, who, who is joining us via Zoom. Um, so, um, yeah, as I said, this subject probably comes in for, um, the less discussion at the moment than it used to, but that was very important to discuss. Um, all four of our panelists tonight and myself are Jewish, um, and, and unfortunately, it's been no stranger to anti Semitism on the left. Uh, I should imagine for most, most of you, they'll need no introduction. Sorry, that was a phone call. Uh, oh, is that the doorbell? Right, okay. Um, yeah, I should imagine that for most of you watching, then our panelists will need no introduction, but I'm going to give you uh, a little bit of an introduction anyway, just in case there's anyone who's there. So, sitting here with me, we have Councillor Joshua Garfield. Uh, Joshua is a Stratford Labour, uh, Labour councillor, um, a former Labour candidate for Braintree, challenging James Cleverley, and a member of the Jewish Labour movement, NEC. Uh, it's also the first time we've met face to face, funnily enough. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, despite knowing each other for what, two or three years. Um, we also have Louisa Atfield here, who is the uh, co youth and students of, of Officer of the Jewish Labour movement, and I think the only panellist apart from myself who is still young enough to be a member of Young Labour. <laughs> <laughs> Um, until January. Are, are you still on to I mean, I'm not sure if you want to, but there we are. To youth, not to the past. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Miriam Milwich, the Jewish Labour Movement's trade union officer, the former chair of both Young Labour and London Young Labour, uh, and a former London Assembly candidate. And uh, finally, as I said, we have Stephen Bush joining us remotely, the political editor of the New Statesman and incoming associate editor of the Financial Times. Congratulations, Stephen. Yeah. Fellow Second Jew, Chair of the Board of Deputies Commission on Racial Inclusivity, favoured go to journalist of Young Fabians and Open Labour for hot takes, but not for the reason that you think. Uh, and I realise, Stephen, that this sounds like a stereotypical Jewish mother here. This is a very long intro that I'm giving you of all your different achievements. But, uh, but there you are, Stephen Bush, everyone. Uh, but, so to start off with, I'm going to ask each of our panellists here to give a couple of minutes opening statement on their broad thoughts on this topic of how kids have been doing with tackling the issue of anti-Semitism. Um, and um, we'll then move on to some additional questions from me, and then finally some audience questions uh, from you here and from anyone watching live on Facebook. Uh, so, from, without further ado, who would like to go first? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, sure. I don't want to take up too much time because I'm really keen that people come out here to spend their time with us to see more questions and spend more time with the children and so on, having a debate. If there happens to be something we disagree on. But I think there's a clear difference between the current Labour leadership on tackling the issue and the previous one, the fact that a willingness to do so and a desire to do so, very much night and day with regard to how the leadership has approached the issue, bringing JLM in, having conversations with the board of deputies, other Jewish representative groups to see where have we gone wrong and how do we take it forward. There was no uh, equivocation with the current accepting recommendations of the EHRC report, something 
but it, for many reasons is quite unprecedented the way in which they came into investigating the findings that they that they came up with and leadership very clearly said we will do this and that i think was sort of the reassurance that the vast majority of the British community, jewish community needed to hear from their party. and that immediately i think however the current leadership tackled the issue everything they, they get right everything they might and um, stumble upon every now and then everything they, we might even get wrong the approach and the goal and the aim is always to make sure they're clear on the issue to make sure that their focus day in day out can be holding government to account and making sure that on the pathway to government as opposed to trying to prove some internal points and in doing so upsetting and, and, and harming like a great deal of people in this country who because of what happened was feeling to lose faith in the party and that is something i think is a chapter that is well and truly behind us I don't much one agrees with this with the direction of the party that issue as a priority is being dealt with for all the right reasons and with the right intentions and that's how i feel personally and so it seems to get a little thing to say <laughs> perfect should we just go around this way or yeah no i'm yeah. going to take my mask off uh, first thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel it's especially lovely to be back here in the real world <laughs> in the faces of the city and um, thanks henry as well for sharing um, so I'm going to be quite quick as well, because most of all, I'm looking forward to a bit of the sort of day and hearing from you guys as well. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit, a little bit about like where we have been, uh, where we are now, and I think what needs to happen going forward. Um, so it, it's really going to come to no surprise to anyone here that the past few years have been pretty awful. Um, we've seen anti-Semitism normalised and internalised and tolerated in the labour movement. Um, and I think it's really important when we have these conversations, we don't just talk about it starting in 2015. I think actually the issue was around for much longer before then um, and, and gradually was ignored, but obviously it got quite clear and very painful the past few years. Um, I have to say, holding an internal position in the Labour Party is very difficult because we love the Labour Party to spend all of our time campaigning for it, all of our free time, all of our Saturdays delivering leaflets, nothing on yours because we want to see it succeed and we believe it's the only force to change this country for better um but constantly jewish activists who are part of that fight are being pushed out and made to feel unwelcome um and i do i did really worry about the impact that that had on, on the next generation of young jewish activists who are coming through and um, seeing what's happening because if you told us all what it would be like i think we would have thought twice about getting involved um, but where are we now on a positive note? So I kind of generally agree with Josh. Kier has made a fantastic step forward, and I think the tone from the top has been really powerful from Angela and from Kier. Um, that sort of zero tolerance on I mean, very clear apology and a clear communication is so important. Um, but that change doesn't happen overnight. Cultural change takes time, but we have some fantastic steps forward, and I think we are in the best possible place that we could be. Um, but we can't sit back and say this progress is enough. I think it's going to require constant allyship and constant solidarity from all of us. So calling out anti-Semitism whenever we see it from our comrades, calling out all forms of discrimination as well. Um, and we can't accept it just because it's from our mates or just because it's convenient. And we can't go back to a place where we're telling ourselves that just because the Tories are bad guys, mm. we are on a higher standard and free from all kinds of prejudice. But that's been a bit too much for me, probably. I'll be a group of Josh. Thank you. Yeah, I should have gone first because <laughs> 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 that's what my point is about being taken up. What I think about Java is that actually understanding is something that genuinely has <laughs> I think I've been putting on Star Marks doing a lot on leadership, and I think you've got to have a habit of saying one thing and then six months down the line doing something else. But he has always been consistent on anti-Semitism, especially sort of once the sort of once uh, the leadership, you know, the way the leadership um leadership competition starts going, and he's really followed for it. Um, and he followed through from the start of his leadership when he was introduced by Ruth Smith, and that, that was a statement that he made and he chose to make. He could have had any MP or any lord or any political figure to introduce him, and he chose a Jewish woman as one of the most prominent voices um, by seeing any nationalities in the Labour Party. And I think, as well as sort of the procedural stuff, the rule changes, the subscribing is really quite over against the way trend. There have been a lot of really positive, small signals. I think signals to Jews both inside and outside the party that Labour is your home. 
things like um, he and Angela going to the uh, coming to party. Um, uh, guests here and you know, not Sankeys, and they then to Plaza and go and then to the conference and I'll find the conference. Um, I think it's sort of that sort of that relationship when especially this under Corbin relationship between not just Gala, but sort of any sort of uh, community body and our own party is not existent by the end of course. I think start to do that really in the field for this thing. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. And uh, Stephen. Hi, uh, I'll, I'll similarly be brief, and uh, I'm I'm sorry not to be able to to be with you uh, this evening. I'm instead uh, waiting to hopefully be freed by a. Uh, I keep saying a lateral flow, but lateral flow is the reason why I'm stuck here. The PCR is the thing's going to going to hopefully free me from my very dark and weird looking kitchen. Um, so I think you know. I would completely agree uh, with with most of what has been said. Um, yeah, particularly then one of the central differences is that um, the conversation about this problem no longer runs through a leadership which um, is at best in denial about the scale of it. But I do think one of the yeah kind of as a sort of sympathetic outsider, um, the one of the sort of problems right is then as as you know as other speakers have said. This is not a problem which um, started in 2015. It's not even a problem which started in, um, in 1983. Um, it's a problem which in many ways predates uh, the existence of the Labour Party, both as obviously a generalised phenomenon. Racism predates the Labour Party. The Labour Party is part of society and it therefore has um, you know, all of, of society's problems within it. Um, but, it, but the specific problem of left anti-Semitism, I think, predates uh, the Labour Party. Uh, Steve Cohen, in his excellent book, That's Funny, You Don't Look Anti-Semitic, um, dates, it, dates it back in its specific British left form uh, to the 1905 Aliens Act. And I think there's a lot in uh, his, his analysis that is, is worth thinking about. I think Keir Starmer has been um, great including in some cases in ways where i think he's been more combative than i would have been if i were were in his shoes he's been great since becoming leader and i think miriam is exactly right to say that the big cultural shift in terms of yeah you know, this problem that had already exi had always existed in the life of the labor party you know becoming mainstream becoming normalized um uh, you know sort of across large swathes of the british left that cultural change will not happen. Yeah, you know, it is not a project of, of, of 18 months or 20 months or however long it's been. But I think one of the sort of the dangerous forces uh, within the Labour Party in terms of actually tackling this problem is what I think of as the kind of the narrative of, you know, um, you know, everything was fine until Jeremy Corbyn was elected uh, leader of the Labour Party. And, um, and, and gradually we're just going to move away from that. Uh, and, and it will all it will all be fine. Now, some of the, you know, many of the problems are about institutions. Obviously, you know, the Labour Party love nothing better than using the rule book to hit people over the head with when it controls the levers of power. Uh, loves almost nothing better than um, you know excusing bad behaviour when it comes from people who are politically important or favoured to a faction. Uh, and then you have the kind of broader sort of cultural intellectual history of of anti-Semitism on the left. And I think. Um, Keir Starmer has been very good and very robust on its specific manifestation in the context of the early 21st century. Has he really touched the sort of broader kind of uh, pedagogic stuff about explaining the cultural history of it? Not at all. And has he addressed the sort of wider cultural problem of um, the, the way the Labour Party operates, the way that you can sometimes be incredibly horrible to each other about a wide variety of things? I'm afraid I would have to say no, not at all. And I think unless he is really ad addressing the problem on all three of those fronts, uh, he is not going to succeed in, you know, what he you know, says is his status target, which is I, I measure success on, you know, not having to, you know, not having to see the words Labour and anti-Semitism in the same, uh, same sentence anymore. Uh, he, he won't succeed if he doesn't attack on those three fronts. Gotcha. Uh, but thank you so much to all our panelists for introductions. Um, so we're now going to take a kind of more broad look um, at really in terms of 
um, experiences for you uh, in terms of organization. So all three of you guys here are uh, members of JLM, very prominent members of JLM. Um, and so I kind of wanted to get the picture. Now, the JLM didn't nominate Keith Dunn, they nominated Lisa Nandy. Uh, and I know that two out of three of you um, at Lisa was your first friend, her preference over there. You're more like the vegan like, uh, yeah. member in that. Uh, but, but, um, but, yeah, but, I love these two. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but so essentially, I just kind of I wanted to get a picture, um, if you guys are able to give it, as to what you sort of feel like the broader, uh, the broader sense is within JLM specifically about how Kira's been received in the last 18 months. Uh, but, yeah. Um, bearing in mind that he wasn't, um, like, you know, the person that um, that they nominated, was it sort of, you know, was that a sense of just sort of um, them trusting Lisa more and liking the sound of what she said more, particularly the last thing um, at last year, or is there, um, like, you know, does it go deeper than that? Has he sort of proven himself much more in those last eighteen months? What 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 do you think the broad feeling in the organisation? Oh, so going back to the broader leadership platform, I say. From what I can recall of the vote, because we did ballot our members, it was pretty much almost 50 50 mm -hmm. with Lisa having a slight majority. Okay. So I think to sort of, I think that should be remembered in the context mm -hmm. that there was not like the other rejected here. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think that it, I don't know how much this plays a role in it. I think if you look at my music here, it's the fact that he is. Um, He's the MP for Camden Beach. He is the sort of MP for an area where lots of jail and all the and so on. You sort of, if you're like active, and, active in your local party, or active in neighbouring parties, or have opinions on the sort of based on him being a local figure of his humanity, you sort of only use tools and power which puts on media and social media. But I think, I don't know, I know some people are very, very positive views here on the local party. I think that's like the style of music here. Like, right. I just don't know how much just the sort of him being very known to the sort of very sort of the active sector sort of North London London is going to screw that. Right, okay. And, and what about you guys? You, what, what's your feeling sort of on now? What the kind of music is here? I think it is been fantastic for Jeremy. I think Jeremy will certainly um, cite Kira as the friend of the organisation. Um, you know, without a shadow, without the Went out of his way on multiple occasions to ensure that we were improving the conversation that we should have been in many, many years ago. Mm. And to ensure that we were, you know, content with the rest of the going in, that we had, you know, um, not quite oversight, but to be as a consultee on many of the ways the party was looking to implement the recommendations of the CHRP, because he's known from day one how marginalised we were for so long. And that, that in a sense, is one of the reasons that we, we swelled. To a sensible process, even though Jay has been around for 120 years and done so many things, Keir recognized that. And I, you know, Louise is quite right that it wasn't doing the votes, but anybody who had gone to the JLM thing in Feb 2020, for example, can you remember that? There were lots of stuff that's you know, almost a thousand people in a room, no problem at all. Well, no little problem there was, there was, there was a problem with that in hindsight. Um, Nobody who went there, almost nobody, I would say, could come out and, and not say, you know, Lisa was the emphatic winner of that debate. Whether or not you still voted for Keir, or, or you voted for Rebecca, because that, that was the candidate that you most preferred, that debate, she was exemplary. Mm. And I think it's because Keir entered the race as, as the front one, undoubtedly so, and he had a, a broad message to get across in many different areas. And tackling anti Semitism was one of them. But for Lisa, who I, I think, yeah, yeah, let's not be around, but she, she knew she was not to win. And so she wanted her rights to be about the things that she truly cared about, the things that she thought led by to clean up. One of them was tackling anti feminism, and she understood the problem, and she demonstrated that she understood the problem far beyond anybody else in that race. Or even I, I would go as far, apologies to do that in the media, you know, I think there's very few people in the media, you, you are one of them, who've got it right consistently. And Lisa, all of a sudden, came out of that devastating election result and when I know the issue is and this is what it is and this is how we tackle it and we can't go anywhere without doing all of this and also on on, on the back foot of of the you know not 
Oh, well, that's probably election the referendum. It's not actually <laughs> <laughs> on the back of that election and, and, and the result. Yeah, emphatic rejection of Jeremy Corbyn, but also an emphatic rejection of our Brexit policy. And in fact, we didn't know what we're doing Brexit. Um, she understood how to communicate that to people who ended up being the, the you know the deciders in that election. So called Red Bull, people in town, etc. So she got that more than anybody. Mm. But that's not to say that Keir isn't a fantastic friend and ally of Jail, and he absolutely is. He's been brilliant to us. And I'm, I'm certainly very happy that he's a leader. I'm certainly very happy that Lisa is up soon. Uh, you know, I've just got my phone. Fair enough. I'm here. So I think he yeah, obviously has been a fantastic friend to JLM as I believe and understand. Um, I think as, as you both said, he's engaged JLM in all of the important conversations they need to be in the room with, and also the broader community organisations as well. Um, but I also think when you look at all of his responses to anti-Semitism, they've been absolutely on point. I remember the press conference on the day that the HRC report was released. His communication was so clear that I think it was just a breath of fresh air. Um, and I think from his time in DPP, we know that he has a really, really high level of competence. And that's one thing that we really do need to back in this issue, um, which is really positive. Obviously, I have a huge amount of respect and love for Lisa Nandi as well. But from a JLM perspective, it, it's helped us to move to a much better place coming here as leader. And I also think that, I mean, in JLM, we often talk about how we want to be just a boring, ordinary social society. And obviously, social society is brilliant, and they do phenomenal work. And, I'm very proud to be a member of quite a few of them, but I'm, I think as JLM, we sort of want to move to a situation where we're just focusing on, you know, Jewish activists, issues that matter to the Jewish community and Jewish members, and we're not having to be in the headlines because there simply isn't a need. Um, and I'm hoping that, that because of this change and because of it, we'll be moving towards that place. Fingers crossed, absolutely. Um, so, Stephen, with regard to you, um, as we said at the top, you chaired the Board of Deputies Commission on Racial Inclusivity. Now, I know that the final report there only really made kind of passing reference to anti Semitism in the Labour Party, but um, at the risk of sort of, this sound like terminal Labour protagonist brain, uh, but then, you know, did, how much did the issue of anti Semitism in the Labour Party kind of come up with any of the conversations you had with? people in the Jewish community at that point, or with the board uh, in relation to that, or even subsequently, um, because I know that you, you basically did most of the work for the commission after um, uh, yeah, after the election, after Corbyn had already, um, uh, you know, had already stopped being leader. So I'm, I'm kind of intrigued about that, for us to get a broader view um, with regard to what the Jewish community's feeling is on here, Yeah, so, um, so the, the commission is is you know is is about um you know it's it's you know it's about racism within our community uh rather than racism uh experienced um you know by our community as a whole so it's about how um those of us who are um well it's about actually how all of us in the community behave not just those of us who are in the uh, ashkenazi uh majority um but it was obviously about you know intra-community racism rather than um uh, racism experienced from it uh, out from outside and it was set up uh, in the wake of the murder of of George George Floyd um but it did come up a lot mainly because for lots of lots of, of, of witnesses both in the written testimony and in some of the the uh, yeah the kind of uh, the meetings I would mostly have via zoom to take oral testimony um it came up a lot because um as everyone who's mixed race knows you you feel your you know, you know, you feel your your multiple identities more acutely whenever they are pressured, right? I felt a lot less black before I was in political journalism, where there's like five non-white people in the lobby. Actually, I think it's slightly more now, but you know, like you know, where you're you know an obvious visible minority. Um, you, I had you know a huge amount of respect for Diane Abbott as a sort of history maker before I was in political journalism, but I really had my opinion of her transformed by being in what is still an incredibly uh, mono-ethnic uh, space, even in 2021. And so lots of our witnesses who experience racism within the community do so because they're mixed race. And the thing lots of them would say is they said, well, I felt like I had a, you know, kind of, which completely accorded with my experience, feeling like they had a, a new third identity that was, you know, kind of separate and theirs as mixed race and feeling they had become more Jewish over the last um, half decade because of the, because they had started to experience anti-Semitism, um, you know, directly in a much greater volume in spaces than they would previously have um, treated as safe spaces, to use a slightly fraught phrase. 
Now, I think the big difference, uh, of course, you know, for me, from everyone else on this panel, and indeed for, for a lot of our witnesses who were, those witnesses who were on the left, which of course uh, was far from all of them, is that um, yeah, I am not part of the 6% of British Jews who still voted Labour in 2019. Uh, whereas I think it's fair to say that most JLM members are, you know, within that 6%, I'll be a pretty critical uh, and, you know, reluctant part of that 6%. It is still a huge issue for lots of people that um, Keir was in the shadow cabinet of Jeremy Corbyn, campaigned for Jeremy Corbyn to become prime minister. And, you know, and, and people will, you know, they'll kind of, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm going to stop ventriloquizing as if these aren't, uh, aren't, aren't, you know, doubts and feelings I broadly share, which is the you know, you can walk yourself through it and you can do the well, tactically with my analyst hat on, I accept and this is a thing you have to do. And tactically, I accept and first past the post, um, you know, praise, pr you know, presents horrendous choices for people, but I'm still really uncomfortable with it. And I think it is true to say that the majority of, um, of, of you know, the Jewish Labour vote, which I'm going to define as the, the people who had stuck around even in 2010, the worst of the, the, the four defeats in terms of vote share, uh, or if you want to define it on the people who stuck around in 2015, uh, uh, you know, after, you know, Ed had taken, a, in my view, a very brave stance on protective edge, but one which was divisive, to say the least, within the community. Um, yeah, the vast majority of those people did not feel able to vote Labour in 2019. And I think there is still a huge anxiety about that. Uh, obviously, he has taken some very courageous stances, which has, has slightly um, taken the, the edge off it. And I think it is broadly positive now that when I am, you know, at an event and people ask me, you know, how I think the Labour Party is doing, um, people who had voted Labour in 2015 or in some cases even in 2017 now um, see, you know, are concerned that, that, that Labour might not win as opposed to being concerned that Labour might win. But there is, yeah, still a huge anxiety about that. And I do think that is in part because while he is you know, making organisational progress, while he's not doing as much of those, attacking those three pillars I was talking about earlier, he's not providing that reassurance to that large number of people who, who did not, uh, you know, who did not feel able to vote Labour in 2019. Yeah, I mean, it was, it's, it's interesting you bring that up, Stephen. I mean, that's, um, but, yeah, I think Mark Hodge has talked about something similar in terms of, uh, yeah, I think it might even have been Margaret who said uh, that, you know, that her father couldn't make her Jewish, uh, but, yeah, right, right, right. Jewish. yeah but, uh, but, but Jeremy Corbyn could make her Jewish, <laughs> uh, but yeah, and, and actually that's sort of, it's, it's an experience that's sort of similar for myself, really, I mean, I'm, you know, um, I used to describe myself as someone with Jewish heritage, as opposed to someone who was Jewish, um, and uh, even though, you know, I, I grew up, um, you know, in a, relatively Jewish household. I mean, we, we, we did Passover every year at my grandparents. Um, we did Rosh Hashanah with extended family. Um, and we'd go to bar mitzvahs. I never had a bar mitzvah for myself. Uh, but, you know, and so beyond that kind of uh, engagement, mainly at Passover once a year, uh, but then my main engagement with um, at Judaism, apart from that, was watching The Prince of Egypt. Great film, rubbish day to make. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, um, yeah. So I was, I, I was kind of intrigued by that. Is that, is that a similar experience for, for you three? I wonder, in terms of um, your relationship to Judea, Judaism, did, 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 did that sort of pressure that sort of Stephen talked about on, on you guys as that an identity? Did that make you feel more Jewish, more connected to, to that? Definitely for me, yeah. I guess I like. I never felt Jewish enough. Like, I'm not sure religion. I didn't have my next stuff. Um, I always saw myself sort of as a virtualized mm. like he is. He was you know, just doing some signs. Um and things like that. I don't yeah. I think yeah, I don't know how to describe myself like this yet. I mean, definitely. I'm a little more mad than Jewish now. Yeah. I'm a little more confident. Yeah. yeah. What, what about you, too? So, I had a fairly Muslim upbringing, so I was pretty religious before getting involved in any party. But I definitely think that um, one of the positives from the past year or so is how much easier it's been to be a Labour activist within Jewish spaces. 
I always felt very guilty um, and I always respected people who would step out and leave because that was a deeply personal choice and, and the right choice for them. But I, I decided to occupy space because I felt like that was the biggest impact I could have in the role that I had um, and try and make noise while I was in that role. Um, but it was very, very difficult on the, on the converse side of things, going into communal spaces, going to show as someone who is a late party person because it almost did feel like betrayal sometimes. Yeah. Um, and the way I've rationalized that was, would be to say that, you know, I'm going to use my position and use the voice and platform, the small platform that I had built up to try and make things better. But that was very, very hard. And I remember actually first getting involved with the movement. I'm not telling people I was Jewish. And the first time I told them I was Jewish was at a young labor event in like 2014. So this is a long time ago. I'm very old now. Um, and um, immediately them asked me about my views on Israel. Which is a very like obviously that's that's pretty Corbyn, right? Um, so it's been a thing for a long time. I was almost nervous about telling people for a long time after that experience, and I was just a, a baby activist. Um, whereas now I think like, I shout that I'm Jewish all the time. <laughs> 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 uh, Josh, yeah, I mean, so my see, the Jewish side of my family was always religiously Jewish, but not communal Jewish, mm. often to reverse to what people say they say people are culturally Jewish, not religious. That side of my family was the complete opposite. It wasn't involved in the community. I mean, I grew up in a, yeah, I grew up, I grew up in, in, in Bradford in, in the East End. Now, now everyone knows about it because of the Olympics. I grew up in the Olympics. Right? <laughs> and uh, there, are, there are no Jews there. They haven't been for a very long time. That's just the way it is. And so you know, going to school, I was the only Jewish kid in my family group. I was often held up to the example of what a Jew might be because they're not a kid. Um, I don't know about that. Yeah, at least. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the favorite thing that I remember from primary school was that the smaller children asking, oh, Miss, Miss, what? It's a church of England primary school, Miss, Miss, what, what color was Jesus? And she was like, well, he was, he was Jewish, so I guess Josh is what color. <laughs> and, <laughs> and there was lots of little sprinkles of that in my child. Nothing that really talked about like Scarlet. It was always a bit, hey, you're different, it's fine. Yeah. You know? On, on, on the weekend, the body of my father was in the synagogue, a little bit further out in, in East London, in South Woodford, and a few more Jews there. And he had in the Jewish share the way it is. And I've, I've got mixed heritage as well. So people used to always be a lot more interested in my, you know, my, my, my father's side and Cypriot and Irish, which is Cypriot Irish, because I don't want to know about that. And that would be more of a conversation start. The Jewish, I wouldn't know anything about what was just like, oh, it's not very fine. Well, yeah, sure. But in the Labour Party, ironically, my, my Jewish identity came up quite early, and it was I got involved properly in 2010, um, and it was on a cam on, on the campaign to make Una King the male candidate for Labour Party. We had two years of Flores as mayor, and it was like, oh, this is the worst you can get. Let's hope he leaves politics from this. <laughs> and it was it was my my my, my grandpa telling me that Kenny Dixon was no good, and I. I mean, he, he, he's a long past away now. I don't really know if he ever, you know, bothered too much with voting Labour or sticking to a party. He was always quite left leaning, but he wasn't tribal in politics. Mm. But Ken Livingston was a man that he couldn't trust. He didn't like me. Yeah. Couldn't really explain to me why. Every now and then he'd say, he doesn't have to do this, and I'd go, but how? But he's too young to mm. So when it was a case of we needed to beat Boris, and Ken wanted a third crack at the whip box third, more like seven or eight to be honest, <laughs> at that point, if we're being true. I was like, well, you know, in the team's roster seat to this absolute awful person, um, the government of Bo, and she seemed decent. I'll go, I'll go volunteer and have name. And it was actually because of her history having been beaten by George Galloway, and because of the fact that she was a, a you know, mixed heritage Jewish MP in the East End of London, and there weren't that many left at that point. It was quite a big part of the campaign, and it was brought up quite frequently. You know, Luna might get these questions, and I'm like, I'll just get these questions. You know, like, wait, it's because she's Jewish, but we need to just find a way of having to ask the questions. If people are from the phone bank, blah, blah, blah. That's it always, it's, it, it, that, that group, that sense of it being somewhat important did grow and grow and grow until it became quite integral to my involvement in the party, more so than it had ever been in my life. No, it's not integral really to any other part of my life. I'm just a Jewish person who takes my religion somewhat seriously and my identity somewhat seriously and you know, has lots of Jewish family. So for every other special aspect of my life, it's an irrelevancy. Apart from now, the Labour Party where it's quite integral. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm interested actually, Miriam, that you brought up um, you know, sort of 
um, going back in terms of you know the first time that it became an issue of um, you know uh, or, you know the first time of mentioning that he was Jewish um, in the Labour Party. Um, actually, something that I noticed both both within the Labour Party and actually at school to a large degree, um, but, you know, on the rare occasions that I would mention that I was Jewish pre you know uh, three or two years ago. Um, I think the first time I mentioned it in the Labour Party would have been in London Young Labour AGM. This would have been 2016, I think. Um, and there was there was talk of the you know the Bain caucus was about to happen. Um, and um, and uh, and well, so the interesting thing about that is that um, I was chatting to uh, I think it was Sid O'Dwyer. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, um, yeah, um, well, an activist in um, in yeah, field. yeah. He's, he's, he's a great guy. Um, and um, and um, yeah, I've been chatting to him. I mentioned the fact that I was Jewish in passing in conversation, I can't remember why. Um, and he said, Oh, you should you should come into the space. And I, I'd never thought about that before. I, I, I felt uncomfortable with, with the notion of you know, of being in a bank caucus and being in a bank space. Um, but actually, you know, and I, I didn't go in that day. Um, and as I say, it's been much more sort of anti Semitism in the Labour Party subsequently that made me identify a lot more strongly with that. And now I'm chairing a, a BAME advocacy group, which I mean, we can talk about the issues of some BAME in, in general, I suppose. But um, yeah, some people have. But, um, but yeah, but sort of identifying as a minority in that way. And actually, I remember growing up. Um, I sort of buried it in my memory, but at school I had experienced some anti-Semitic abuse, mainly of the kind of, you know, um, people quoting South Park jokes at me, and as someone who never watched South Park, then you're not going to see the funny side of people going, you do, you do, you effing do, etc. Um, but always the people that tend to do that kind of bullying to me were other white kids. Um, the ones that weren't, and the ones, if anything, that tend to jump to my defence, were other people of colour and other people of other minorities. I've always felt welcomed in that kind of space and yeah, and as I say, in the Labour Party that continues um, to a certain degree. And it's yeah, it's it's often been, you know, in, in many cases other white people for whom the, the, uh, that's been an issue. Um, yeah, that was sorry, a bit of a diversion, but um, the point I was gonna make on, on top of that is how do we feel the internal party culture has changed. Is it, you know, I think Miriam, you said that it's gotten easier to be a Jewish person in the Labour Party in your view. Um, what do you guys think about that? And, you know, particularly with, say, the complaint, um, you know, the complaint process, for example, I don't know if any of you have to submit subsequent complaints to <coughs> Kira to become leader, but. I mean, I think I stopped even complaining to Kira about like four or five years ago. I've <laughs> never come back. Yeah. Oh, and then I was kind of like randomly scribbling my thoughts. Um, I think it's overly simplistic to sort of describe and say that they can't be sort of a hard left issue. Sure. Or to say that it belongs to a faction. Mm. But there's something, I think factionalism, I think, amplifies and drives anti Semitism. And I think actually, most of the issues that we see in our party in terms of the internal culture, people are protected, viewed and offended by the people in their faction who they would be throwing under the bus if they were the other one. Yeah. And I think like a really obvious example of it is um um starting a live against the witch hunt and stuff they have a I don't know what the name of it. Owen Jones, he's like Who's, who's, who's on the on the record tweets that he thinks it's actually a good thing that um living against which her labour and exile and what's the other one having to cry? He's not sure he doesn't think that we should have to do it. Yeah. And then but then a week later the um officer or chair, one of the two, someone who has a very prominent role in labour against the which has um Ken Loach is um also excluded, as is the rule. For being a sponsor of a disgraceful organization, Owen Jones immediately went to his defense. So he made a union statement, so he made some peace. So does it what feels like being on Twitter half the Labour Party? And how was that a moment? Is he is still like going back several years? And it is this 
in settled sort of culture of having sides and having politics that sort of surrounded more based on different people and their values. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think he has helped himself because I think that's that time he's pushed up after all, but I also do not think those clubs show him any way to vote. Yeah. And I don't I also don't know how he could even start to try and fix it. Mm. Yeah, this this one that I mean, uh, Dwight, do you want to come back on that um, for yeah. I think the interesting thing about the prescription of, of those groups and anybody who felt like the groups needed or, or deserved defending is that I mean partly it's for the people all over the political spectrum who want the common aim of eventual government, changing the country, getting the Tories out, making sure they know. What you want to do is look at any of the thousands of figures over the past 11 years to you know, try our out the face of the country. We want to change that. And maybe you want to debate about exactly how you do it. Because you know, come on, go on. People in these groups do not have that thought. People in these groups, their sole purpose and their existence and their activism and, and 100% of their energy is about trying to prove the point that their friends and their allies are the real socialists. And that is where they put all of their energy. Now, I've got, I've got ample time because under these certain media, I'm not a Labour member, I'm not really your wing, you're not really my wing, this is where I disagree with you and this is policy, let's have a talk. Absolutely got ample time for you, I want to have a chat about it, whether it's, you know, the railways, welfare, employment, green economy, you name it, let's have a chat about it because we have that common goal. I can't have that conversation with anybody in the groups because all they want to know is, well, I'm, you know, the litmus test of where you stand on Corbyn and my real socialist friends. And do you support or oppose the witch hunt? Are you one of us or why you're not? And if you're not, you're the enemy, you're the bad of the Tories, you're worse than the Tories. Blah, 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 blah. You cannot involve yourself in a political movement with these people and think you have any chance of a severe attempt at government. You can't involve yourself with these people and think you have a severe attempt at any chance of spending your time productively. So that always baffled me when people, you know, you mentioned Alan Jones. Not just him, but, but so many want to spend their energy, and they are the people who at least 95% of their energy want to spend doing what we want to do get into government, changing the country. But they still reserve a little bit to come out back to those people, and you think, why? You are doing so much harm or so little gain, it is not worth it. And that I don't think is factional. That is more about a moral clarity issue about the party. You cannot align yourself with those people whose sole focus and energy is doing that. You know, um, so I, mean, I guess that's what I would say in terms of the idea that by prescribing those groups, people accuse Kira of, of being factional. Mm -hmm. Prescribing those groups has absolutely nothing to do with factionalism. You absolutely need to move forward and get rid of toxic elements of the party that hold you back from mm -hmm. achieving change, you know, achieving progress. And that's the bottom line. The fact that he's done that, I think, draws that line in the sand. That we are a serious movement and all of our different stripes across the left, across the centre, want to get the Tories out of government and get into it and do policies that change people's lives, not muck about it rubbish. Yeah, and just to clarify, talking about the factualism and yeah. that is the people who are defending these groups. Yeah, yeah. Simply on the basis that key is already. Yeah. And I mean, one of them, Chris Williamson's group is different in the school. Yeah. Um, literally trying to become another party to stand against Labour. It doesn't need to be prescribed because it's pretty explicit in the rule book that that is not compatible with those membership. And we have members of our NDC who go to the end prescribing it. Um, and that's disgrace. Yeah. It's honest to God disgrace. You know? So when it comes to votes like that on the NDC, we aren't talking left and right. We're not talking policy. We're not talking exactly how should we approach the redistribution of wealth in the country. What role should business have? What role should families have? Well, what should our messaging be with regard to long forgotten industries? We're talking about some incredibly awful people, again, who 100% of their energy is going into battling the party and making sure that you think that they're friends that are a socialist. And if you've got any truck spending your time doing that, you're in, you're in the wrong place. You know, the whole, the, whole, the whole point of this step of the Labour Party is to drag us out of the dark hole that we've been in. One may say since the last election, smashed the throne. One may say um, since 2015, but one may say since 2010. Who knows? Well, I've not been powerful in a year. Long, long, dark, deep black hole. But 
vote in that way, I would really struggle with it on the NEC. There's a lot of people I respect from the NEC whom I didn't vote for. The people who vote against that sort of stuff, I have I haven't got a single second of time for them. I'm coming to pick up something that you said Henry really quickly, which is about um solidarities well between other communities. Um, and I've always said that the first people who usually message me when I have anti Semitic views, but particularly have been Muslim comrades, particularly my comrades with people of colour, and that kind of solidarity is really important. So it's because we want that both both ways, and that we stand together with all of our Muslim brothers and sisters when they experience these as well. Um, and that is why Stephen's report is so important that we embrace them within the Jewish community. Um, and I'm also going to pick up something that Steve said about the internal culture of the party that it's so important that we we take a step forward to make it less toxic, but it's still it's still not great. We've still got some way to go, and and things like the reform and complaint system is a really important part of that. Things like peers tone from the top is really important, but I think all of us also have a huge personal responsibility. We call out unacceptable conduct to hold others to the same standard that we hold ourselves to. Um, and also to be vocal on the other forms of oppression. So especially I'm going to pick out like anti-black racism and also transphobia, um, because we can't let other communities go through what the Jewish communities went through or, or worse. And many of those communities are going through worse at the moment. Um, so we have a huge, huge journey ahead of us. Yeah, absolutely. And I think yeah, it's particularly important that you bring up anti-black racism and transphobia, um, but yeah, the other phobias that are all the other bigotries. Um, transphobia in particular, I think, is one that a lot of people are noticing similar patterns of behaviours from certain elected representatives. Um, I, I want to bring um, Stephen back in first on this and then um, ask, ask the rest of you. Um, so, in respect of what some of you have been saying about nationalism, and um, yeah, Louis has said that in some ways that Keir has behaved um, at, you know, um, with regard to factionalism, at least on some occasions. Um, I wonder what you guys' view is on Rachel Reeves. Um, now, Rachel Reeves, for those who are not aware, wrote a book about um, women in Parliament and the history of women in Parliament. Um, and one of the kind of key figures in this book was Nancy Astor, uh, the first woman MP to take up her seat in the House of Commons. She's not the first woman MP, uh, that's a Sinn Féin MP uh, the year before, but the first woman to take up her seat in the House of Parliament was Nancy Astor. Um, Nancy Astor was a Conservative MP and was also um, particularly known um, in, some, um, in some courses for uh, having potential Nazi sympathies and, um, you know, and expressing anti-Semitism. Um, something that has always bothered me with regard to Rachel Reeves and made me very uncomfortable with Keir appointing her to the Shadow Cabinet at all, at least without addressing this, um, is the fact that, you know, Rachel Reeves, and I've, I've double-checked in her book, um, she has never really addressed any of that. She has lionised Nancy Astor, um, and at best, there is passing reference to her anti-Semitism in, uh, in the book, essentially to dismiss it, and essentially to say, um, you know, that, um, you know, uh, Nancy Astor's um, views on appeasement weren't anything to do with Nazi sympathy or anti-Semitic feeling. This is, a, um, this is a, a woman, Nancy Astor, who has an entire entry on her Wikipedia page, which is almost exclusively de uh, devoted to her anti-Semitic views. Um, so it's something that I feel very uncomfortable with. Um, it's something that on the whole, a lot of uh, people do bring up for factual reasons. And it's part of the reason why I want to bring it up myself, because I want to bring it up from a perspective of someone who is broadly sympathetic to everything that Keir does on anti-Semitism. But that is something that makes me feel uncomfortable, and I'd like to know what you guys' view is on that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this is a very dangerous question because I love to bore on about history and remembrance. Um, so you may just have to start bashing the mute button when I'm still going in, you know, 40 hours time. Um, so, look, my essential view, and I completely understand um, why it makes um, you feel uncomfortable. I also completely understand as you kind of, one always has this kind of weird conflict where people bring it up and you're like, look, if you can't tell the difference between like the Asta stuff and like the mural or, you know, the various issues with the complaint complaint system, you know, well done, you're, 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 you're a moral void. But um, for me at least, I'm afraid I don't share the discomfort 
um in the same way i don't share that yeah there's this thing in bits of the community where people love to go oh you know um they've cancelled enid blyton for like her being racist but no one talks about roald r being an anti-semite it's like well you know, like roald r was a a vile anti-semite but you know his his books are are not problematic in the way that enid blyton's books uh are just obviously sexist and and you know do have you know, what we now correctly think of as racist language in them. Um, and I kind of think ultimately Nancy Astor was the first woman to uh, to take her seat. And that, you know, it's kind of like whether we like it or not, that is a historical truth. Just as, you know, Benjamin Disraeli, the first and as so far only ethnic minority to become prime minister in this country, um, was, you know, a massive sexist. He was wholly relaxed with the fact that women couldn't vote, right? Um, and now, what I don't like, and again, I sorry, I am gonna bore on that, is what I don't like about the kind of, um, the sort of approach to memorializing Astor that I feel Rachel takes, is it is very kind of like, okay, let's focus on the like trailblazing stuff and not focus on the fact that, yeah, like, our history is by definition complex, contradictory. You know, many people who are pathfinders, um, you know, have do things that we do not agree with and occupy positions that we don't like. Um, and I kind of think in terms of that broad culture point, it is a it speaks to the problem that Keir has never really addressed it. Not for me at least, and I want him to say she shouldn't have done it. But I would, I think it's important for the leader of a party to be able to articulate, look, one, this obviously is a completely different end of the continuum, but also there is a genuine debate about, you know, what's the value of our history? You know, some people might say, actually, look, the one thing history teaches you is people don't learn from history. Um, like, and they actually, you know, it's, it's interesting, but, you know, don't make a career or a lifestyle out of it. Some people would say, oh, we need to study our history and all of its warts. Some people would go, do you know, it's actually fine to create this kind of like sanitized fake Nancy Astor who was just kind of like, you know, a path, you know, kind of, yeah, you know, kind of to sort of remove her actual political edges. Um, those are all acceptable um, debates. I, I very much do prefer the warts and all um, perspective, but I guess I, I just feel like ultimately we can't escape from, you know, the fact that Nancy Astor was an anti-Semite. I mean, we can't escape from the fact that Ernest Bevan, uh, foreign secretary for most of, of Attlee's government, was an anti-Semite. You know, there'll be some people on the soft left, including, you know, within our own within our own community, who, who won't like that Nye Bevan, as well as being the architect of the NHS, was a massive uh, Zionist and a believer in the, the right of the state of Israel, as indeed was, was Michael Foote. History is, is always complicated. And, you know, to, to broaden, and I, I think it's why Miriam is so right about the fact that ultimately there is never any enduring progress for any group when it's based around exemptions. Yeah, I'll specific to them. It, uh, uh, you know, like ultimately, like it is only broad based things like the Equality Act, like fixing, you know, your processes and culture for everyone that, that endure. Um, but there's a broader political issue here, which is that the Conservatives want to have a kind of distracting fight about, you know, like, are you for Rhodes? Are you for the Churchill statue? Are you for this? Are you for that? And, you know, obviously the leadership wants to be able to mainly move on and focus on, you know, the fact that, like, the public realm's in a heck of a state. But I think that unless they can articulate the case for history and its complexity, which does start with things like how we talk about Nancy Astor, they're never going to be able to have the the election debate you want to have, which is about the condition of the public services. Anyway, I will will stop rabbiting on about history now. Uh, not at all. Um, yeah, and, and, and that was sort of, yeah, that's the aspect that makes you feel uncomfortable about it, really, is, is the fact that Rachel Reed's approach to it seems to not be a warts and all approach. You know, that, that it does sort of feel like it's sanitized if you have to. And I have no problem with us talking about the important contribution that has to make to history. My issue is that, um, it does, um, you know, it's not acknowledging the warts of that and the issues with that. Um, and that's the bit that makes me uncomfortable with it. And so, uh, yeah, I kind of try to maybe get you guys to order your plan and order these questions. I, mean, I guess that's a question of, of, of the idea of everything that happened. I think mm -hmm. lots of people have got that example in comparison to, to, to say, to say I, suppose, I suppose, in terms of an isolated life for life, you could compare it to those before. But 
It was written for remind me of the book. Uh, 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 Fox's Imperialism, I thought it was. Well, it's done, yeah. Henry. Your fractional knowledge is <laughs> <laughs> defeated. Right, yeah. It, 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 well, the like, isolated comparison is like, bam, bam, equal top trumps. What are you going to do, right? But ultimately, people were not offended and upset and, 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 and persuaded by that forward because it happens in an isolated rapture. It was because it was another, another straw on the back of a camel that was fed up of there being endless blind spots on this one issue over the past three decades. And yet no one seems to understand that this paints a bigger picture. It wasn't because that forward in and of itself was a travesty, right? I'm sure the book is a travesty. <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't the issue, right? And if they're yeah. equal, and I think, I mean, you're, you're most likely right. I'm sure if I were to read this, um, this, this, this book, this book like, wait, yeah. it's written, and read that part on that theater around and think, well, I'd write it differently, perhaps. I'm not a historian. I don't wish to call into question Rachel Reese's credentials as a historian either. But I might read it and think, well, I would have gone slightly more down that path. I would have painted a different line. Blah, blah, blah. But also, she was obviously approaching that book with a view to highlight all of the achievements made by women in politics in this country and wanted to do so in a way that probably amplified a literary agent, a publisher. Blah, blah, blah. We're not looking at a pattern of behavior whereby Rachel has done a series of problematic things and demonstrated a blind spot to an issue of racism. We're instead looking at perhaps a piece of history that I might have written differently. And it isn't the same thing. Yeah. And I would I would I'd be quite happy to defend that to somebody and say it just isn't the same thing. And if you want to start comparing things in a vacuum, then I'd like to live where you live because I'd love to live like you. <laughs> and, um, I live somewhere where all the things that we do compound and add up and, and, and make people who they are and they are good and they are bad and they are complex and things require apologies and things like that is not the same thing. I, I think the other thing with like you know, wants to go. It's such a, it's such a common thing to do. We all do it. We all slightly change the facts to fit our biases. We all slightly we just ignore things that are inconvenient about people, people for whatever reason we admire. I mean, like sitting, like sitting in the baby in society, which is found by Genesis. Yeah. So good now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I like that some people on Twitter and said that posting, using that as some sort of gotcha. And I don't know, but and it's just like you know, if you can't understand that. What it's like, I don't think they really, I don't think you give history that no. no. But if was she trying to write this history that or was she trying to write like the important things about women and like the contributions of women? Um, I think there are a lot of people in history who have done. Who've done some awful things, they've thought awful things, and I think they are continuing, they are continually well off. And I think, I don't know, there's something about the fact that it's always this one example of racial mm -hmm. reasons and anti and it's like, yeah, as well as like the lack of pattern behavior and things like that, it's like basically most, most, most biographies are famous people. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. Uh, anything to add, Miriam? Um, I feel like all of you want to be covered. I mean, I will say that obviously I would never endorse ignoring Nancy Ashton's door as well as Nancy D. Martin, which she obviously talks about that. Uh, Rachel was personally very supportive for me when I was experiencing anti semitism so I think the point about passion behaviour is really important. Um, one of the things I also want to mention, not in, in respect to Rachel Reese, which is a more general point, um, is about people's capacity to learn and grow. So just off the back of this in the week and the comments that he made, we are all capable of saying things which are unacceptable um, and discriminatory every single one of us. And what matters is how do we respond to that? Do we apologize? Do we demonstrate that we've learned and that we've grown? Um, or do we double down and continue those behaviors? Um, because that response difference is really what counts. And I think as we are all more potentially online, especially young people growing up online, we're going to see more young people than I said, completely stupid things, unacceptable growing up. Um, obviously, they should be held accountable for the comments because it isn't acceptable, but they should also, everyone should be given the opportunity to learn and grow. But that means demonstrate learning, learning and growth. So if you're not apologizing, if you're not demonstrating my disease, that you understand and you recognize consequences of those actions, and people like Nasha and Azima model examples of how to do that, um, obviously those people shouldn't be revealing. Um, and I think one of the things we're talking about labor and sensitive is we were never out to just ruin 
people like people always have the opportunity to apologize and demonstrate learning and growth like Nesha. But many people decide not to take those open hands and those opportunities. And that's and that's what matters. Yeah. And I would say the other thing is the sort of being too online, learning, growing, it's I think there's very much a in Kelly and in the fashion, is very much a gotcha culture in the party. And yeah. if people see something, if people see something that someone has made online that is not acceptable, far too many people will quite happily screenshot it, ignore it, and then use it as fuel several years down the line when they might they might stand into a position that actually call it out then and there. Or even just address it. Or address it, or drop it on message. Yeah. Yeah. It depends what obviously what it is. Yeah, to demonstrate growth, to apologise, to demonstrate change. And it seems abundantly clear to an awful lot of us that the one thing that, that Jeremy Corbyn uh, needs to do um, <laughs> is to apologise and demonstrate genuine contrition, and he doesn't seem to be able to do that. Um, and indeed, so many people seem to... Not ability to think every first thing is agency, but he doesn't want to. Yeah. He doesn't want to. I, yeah. I, I, I know... I, I, I love to say, but I kind of like to move on. And now I just think he's not a man who's had his ego fed too many times. Times so he just can't stand the first foot of being wrong. I, I mean, for literally five years, because some people literally worship him as the new Messiah. I remember joking with someone after, uh, I, I, I think I was actually joking to Jack Phillips. Uh, your, your wife, I don't care whatever it is at the moment, but that's not my business. But the, he was literally the new JC. See, he was literally the new JC. So I think that's all gone to his head. Yeah, completely. Um, right, let's open up to all these questions. We've got probably about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, Renna. So, one of the things I was really interested in about it, Stephen originally raised the point and people touched about it is this idea of the potential for backsliding because the approach is not sufficiently holistic. I think my biggest concern around this whole conversation is, is this almost just leadership contingent? Great, we've got someone who's presently, you know, listening to JLM's concerns and is saying the right things and doing the right things. And I was wondering from the panelists, to what extent do they actually feel that the changes which have taken place over the last 18 months actually feel not real because real is not the right way to say it but sort of permanent and Same. sort of almost yeah. yeah you know sort of irrespective of who comes mm. after Starmer mm. I'd be interested to see people's perspectives mm. on that really I think that's my biggest worry at the moment I guess I guess that depends on whether you saw the problem as a single sort of I suppose camp or so that had to be ripped out and then you're done or if you saw it as something that needed to be tackled and then kept at the forefront of one's mind continually throughout the management of the party, the running of the party, the organization of the party. You know, the party that not, not for all its history by, by any stretch of, of the imagination, but for certainly for a good period of time to pride itself on its you know, supposed anti-racist credentials and you know, ensuring that we've introduced you know race relation um, legislation and then the Equality Act, etc. And that should always be something that they're doing. We know that it's not a case of you pass the law or you don't. We've always known that that's something that you keep tackling, keep educated about, keep learning, keep going. Because equality isn't something that happens through one change or five changes or a set list of changes. And so that's something that I would, I would say is where you begin. And ultimately, I think that the party would have proven that to us when it's no more an initiative that it may be elsewhere and it's not seen and perception is, is almost as important as reality it's not seen as a uniquely labeled or a uniquely left-wing problem and for a while 
that has been the perception because that has been many people's experience. Mm. It needs to not be something that anybody outside the party, any, any of our opponents can capitalize on because it isn't something that isn't as much an issue in, in your own quarters. And we are dealing with it head on, we are tackling it head on. And when it happens, as Miriam said, we sort of we spot it, we root it out, we give people the opportunity to, to learn, to grow, and to take the fitness. If that's happening, then we know we're in a sustainable position. If it's contingent on an NEC election or an NCC election or one of the other God's forsaken acronyms that we're always voting on, then we're in a terrible place. It needs to not be the defining issue, it needs to not be that me and my friends, we're the real anti racist. No, in fact, me and my friends, we're the real, real anti racist. If as long as we're doing that, we're in a terrible place and we've got to come out of it. But as soon as it's okay, we are actually on the same page. Anybody who doesn't take this seriously and is absolutely stoked on the problem is well and truly our party. And we are made up of people who, like I said at the beginning, regardless of our political strife, all the government want to change the country, um, then we're not going to have those kind of elections. Anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, I think it's a really good question um, because, I mean, yeah. As Josh says, right, it's, it, it's the it's never finished, right? You know, although you know a Roman time traveler almost certainly wouldn't understand our conceptions of race, uh, they would nonetheless express racism in in one way, shape, or form, right? So the problem is sort of baked into the the cake and is the human condition. But for me, the specific um, the specific labor issue um, to quote something a friend of mine said, they said, you know. They said this they said i know this issue will be over when i can go back to hating everything else you, everything you stand for um and their point being you know then like we're you know we're both jewish people on the left we don't agree on a great deal other than the fact that anti-semitism in the labor party was a problem um and, and, and essentially like the the point when um you know the point when um you know when 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 people can can go back to feeling that they can express their divisions about other things more than having to talk about the thing they agree on all the time is a, is a key set. How much of that is leadership contingent? Um, I mean, in terms of the stuff which, you know, I can see anecdotally and hear from people who, you know, who are party members and clearly doesn't matter about, you know, the internal culture at meetings, all of the rest. Uh, and in terms of, you know, at the moment, right, um, action on this is heavily contingent on one specific set of NEC majorities. However, and this does come back to one of my criticisms of, of how Keir has approached this, right? Ultimately, the thing about the EHRC ruling is if you hadn't voted it through a party conference, right? If you'd done the thing that some of Keir's critics wanted to do, the regulator gets to kick the doors in, lads. Like they, yeah, like they they get to, you know, like they 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 get to rewrite your rule book if if you aren't um aren't minding your P's and Q's. Now I completely understand why politically Keir Starmer wants to present uh, himself as this agent of change and this is a thing he's making happening. Well, he's making it happening in the same way a big bank is making being compliant with their post-financial crisis regulatory obligation. <laughs> like, I mean, like, you know, good for you, but but even but e even allowing for the fact that the Conservatives have basically, you know, legalised most crimes now uh, just to not having the forces to prosecute them. You know, like like that ain't why the bank does that, and that ain't why the Labour Party is is making these changes. I I, I do worry that um. And without that kind of cultural thing, we haven't got onto it because it is, you know, well, it's not, I was about to say it's another topic, but it isn't really, right? I don't think you can discuss um, and properly solve Labour's failings on anti-Semitism without understanding how they fit into the broader Westminster story of Westminster's failings on Me Too, right? I'm not saying Me Too has changed uh, the rest of the world as much as we would like, it hasn't. But if you, if you imagine every other field of public life, and you kind of think about how Me Too has at least ended one person's career. And then, you know, we essentially have all of Westminster's political parties where Me Too is this series of irregular verbs of, you know, like, he is, a, you know, he faces credible allegations, they have been stitched up, this person is, you know, our, our new, you know, minister or shadow minister for, for X, Y, Z. Um, and, and I think that culture change at the moment, you know, feels, feels as if, you know, it, it's a long way off under this leadership, might not happen under it but certainly wouldn't uh, under a lot of other scenarios. But I think, you know, as, as an outsider, I think actually um, won the, the big, you know, the big victory that JLM won um, by going to the EHRC is they is backed up by the force of British law. Uh, 
the challenge for Paul Keir is to make sure that there is a cultural change in the wider Labour Party, you know, across, you know, all of the 11 herbs and spices that are the 11 protected characteristics in the Equality Act. Um, that is his big challenge. But I think in terms of this specific problem, I think that is baked into the cake. Progressives and Jenny, um, thank you for the really great question. I mean, just look at look at what the Tories are doing to the fantastic achievements of the last Labour government working everything apart. And I think we can't be just sitting back now and saying, right, that's it, Andy Sensen is done with we want to like you know everything else. I think it is still gonna lurk in part to our movement. We have to just as all forms of racism will be in a society and will be in Labour movement, and we have to be incredibly aware and, and, and continue supporting that because it will it will start to creep back if we're not careful um, as, as all forms of discrimination could do. Um, I do think that we've taken a major step forward, but as, as you said, cultural change is the key and that cultural change takes a long time to filter from the very top downwards to our CLP meeting, to our branch meetings. Um, apologies for the endless acronyms, um, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time unfortunately. And, um, I do worry that if things were to change and if things were to move the situation for someone who wasn't, didn't believe in anti Semitism for being a problem, was legally good season backsliding. Um, but I, I hope that now we've, we've moved the cultural dial on the main party so that people don't feel comfortable saying these things out loud. You want me to put out anything? Or... <laughs> I think you're a lot more optimistic than I am. Um, <laughs> very no, I, I think. The Parliament of Change is the year shocking my basic rule changes against the anti Act. Well, it seems that here Parliament came up quite a four. I think the culture is improving, I think that could change. We, we see, we've seen it change very well, we've seen it change. Um, we think that that was going to get worse than it was in the future. And so, yeah. Fair enough. Um, anyone else? Hopefully, they can get kicked out quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, Laura. Thank you very much and thank you so much all of you for speaking today and I think it's been a really really important discussion that we have particularly as Louise says being sat in the Fabian Society that has this horrendous history and you know in some ways that's a credit to the sort of learning and growth but we're able to sit here and have a progressive discussion today and I think that's something we need to do so much more of as a party I think Miriam you talked about how we need to actually learn and grow to make the culture better um, so what do you view as the most important immediate next steps that the party should be responsible for in terms of improving culture and making it less toxic and, um, what's the word, intimidating for young Jewish activists entering the party, if there is anything that they are able to do to make that, make that better at this point in time? So I think a big part of it is on all of us creating a welcome space. I know it feels like a bit of a cop out to talk about the responsibility around the structures because obviously that's a huge part of it. And the changes are the EHRC report are a huge part of that. But I think all of us have a responsibility to make young spaces in the Labour Party and within Fame Society as well. And obviously, you're doing a fantastic job and a really welcoming and, and lovely space. And that means walking to rooms and thinking about what those rooms look like. Um, are those rooms all the same faces and opinions? Um, how how welcome are you being? How accessible are you being? Um, are there structures in place for complaints and things like that? And obviously, you know, I think both Josh and Stephen were right to talk about sexual harassment as well and how we have a huge amount of work to do ahead of us to tackle that. Um, so I think it's about, um, you know, standing up as well to your mates if they do things which are unacceptable um, in meetings. Oh, one of the things I find very helpful is um, when non-Jewish allies stand up and, and speak with us and stand with us. I remember um, someone in my CLP coming to scream at me after a meeting about how my talk about anti semitism had made her feel uncomfortable. Um, and it was this amazing lady in my CLP, who I'm not going to name because I don't have permission, who literally physically put us, I didn't even say anything about it, she was just screaming at me between us and said, no, you can't do that, and just gave me the space to leave. So just being there and being an ally is really, really Uh, this might seem like a stupid question, but please laugh it if it is. But I'm not on Twitter, so I, I'm mainly of Jewish heritage, but my grandparents are very much community Jewish rather than at all religious, so the complete opposite to you, to you, to when my mother was 
1819 completely left out of the curation of race. race. So I sort of, where am I going with this curation? I just wanted to give you this introduction. Uh, so, and the fact that I attended the CLP meeting before this, be, before the pandemic, the, I think I attended one CLP meeting in quite a few years due to work. So the thing about anti-Semitism was a, a major thing for me. I think I got off quite lucky. I can't stand much. Uh, but you hear all these rumours that I said, to, I said to, to, not exactly it's gone away, but it's come more factional that it's now witch hunt against the left. I'm curious your views on this and the views on, on Jewish voice to labour. I don't. I'm not a member of either of them. So I'm not Jewish. Which I don't. <laughs> it's a religion to me. <laughs> no, that's not mine. <laughs> my, my first question to somebody who's there was a faculty and a similar in a way that's being drawn as an attack on the left is well, why, why does your shade of the left self identify with that anti Semitism? Why, why is it to you so interchangeable? Going after these anti Semites is it in some way encroaching on your left wing shade. Like, why, why do you feel personally attacked by that? And if you do, is there not a question to be asked about exactly which politics you've aligned yourself to, and exactly which politics you've chosen to make a key part of your political identity? And that's always my question for them, because ultimately, people who are, you know, far more to the center than I, people who are far more to the left than I, can have a debate on a number of different things and are very decent people by any stretch of or, or my imagination that have never said to me, oh, I think this anti-Semitism stuff is an attack on my people. They never said that to me. Because that's never an issue that they're a problem with. If at any point they didn't understand why something was anti-Semitic or a cause of harm, they went away and asked Jewish people. They went away and they asked me and they asked others and they went, oh, I get it. I get why that's been twisted up with that. I get why this imagery has found itself a home on some sections of the left around the world and why people adopt it and don't realise people are there. I get that. That isn't my politics. My politics is trade unionism, you know, or my politics is seizing the means of production, whatever it might be. <laughs> right? That's what they identify with. That's not what we're going after with. You know, it's not I'm not saying, are you or have you never been a communist? We're not the Mazarsi trial. We are asking people whether or not they think that they should have a right to share racist content online, whether or not they think they should be outwardly defending people who have said racist things who have defended Holocaust deniers who have aligned themselves with to align themselves with a politics that is so eager to ignore any concern by any Jewish person before that Jewish person nails their flag to your mark and your mark only. You know? So anybody who thinks that these measures are attacking their part of the left need to query why they're on their part of the left. That, that was quite that the question. It was more there's rumors that that basically the Jewish um, activists on the left are actually being. <laughs> okay, so there are a few things. I think um, left them, the left them, the left them, how extremely cynically um, they think that the Jewish activism as a way of attacking not really what I meant. They have, um, they have a lot of issues with Islam and they want to come out. But first, it's the same. They decided that that means. That any of his reforms on anti Semitism are also should be imposed. Because apparently, apparently it's impossible for um, someone to have mixed um, mix bad and mixed views yeah. or like views to like some, some things or whatever. And so, yes, I think that, that's a big part. I think there are a certain number of voices of people who have made themselves very, very prominent names who are constantly on the media. Yeah, these are around sort of like the handful of sort of Jewish voice for later to go They're not that big group. They're, and if you, if you like see them on the radio or the TV or in speaking on conference floor, it's always like one of the six or seven same people. And they become very common figures and they have all of the variety of different roles they've been suspended, also excluded, been investigated, kind of depending on the person. And then they've Shown some very dodgy stats that somehow mean they're more likely to be targeted because they're Jewish. But like I study stats, it's not how they are going to be stats, right? You do live them stats. <laughs> 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 but yeah, um, so that's, and it's also a bit, if you're going, yeah. 
Yeah, um, coming back on that just briefly, um, yeah, there is um, one of the things that I find very insidious about the way momentum or uh, other uh, you know, uh, uh, people identify on the left will behave with regards to that is that they will refer to, you know, if you criticize the Jewish voice for labor, if you criticize, um, you know, a, a smaller <laughs> Jewish group that broadly aligns itself um, uh, with, with Jeremy Corbyn, um, or, you know, with that strain of thinking, um, and aligns itself with the viewpoints that this is um, a witch hunt or that it's exaggerated or whichever. Um, there's often the accusation levels that people that, so are you saying that these people are the wrong kind of Jew? Um, yeah, or, um, or, or they will highlight that, you know, um, the Jewish community is not a monolith and some of them have different views on this, where, where is that being represented? Um, now, that is true. The Jewish community is not a monolith. Um, but, you know, all of us uh, but have different views on different things. Um, but as I remember um, a, bit, um, a particular thing Stephen said once um, with regard to, uh, it was 68 rabbis that wrote to uh, the Labour National Executive Committee to say, um, you know, to, uh, to say, uh, but we think you should sign up to um, the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism along with all the accompanying examples. Yeah, as Stephen said at the time, um, a lot of the people on that list of those 68 rabbis didn't even necessarily agree that the others counted as rabbis. <laughs> um, you know, it, um, you know, to get that level of consensus among um, Jewish communities, there was an old joke about two Jews, three opinions. You know, it is really, really difficult to get the Jewish community as a monolith to agree on anything. And yet the vast, vast majority of us agreed, you know, that this was an issue and that it hadn't been exaggerated, but, you know, that they were needed to sign up to the IHRA definition, that it needed to implement the HDHRC uh, RC reforms, all those different things. Now, that's not to say that the people in JDL, uh, you know, the Jewish Voice for Labour or other groups, um, are not legitimate, uh, legitimate Jews or are not Jewish, of course not. But they, they are very much a minority viewpoint within a minority. I also think it's really alarming, just as an aside, how the, the theory around which has become was conspiracy. Mm -hmm. I think it's very much allied with other historical yeah. thinking. Um, and you see similar kind of left wing and patterns, and you see with other conspiracies yeah. like people around 5G or anti vax. And that, that anti Semitism has always historically tied itself into the like conspiracies, but you see that see that on the left that it was all really a witch hunt. Um, and, and it's, it's quite scary when you read online, I wouldn't recommend it. Not being on Twitter is an excellent line choice. I thought that. I sort of signed up then, but I was trying to find a family friend, teenage daughter at the time, did this with some. So she didn't want well, her mind had been taken away from her, uh, so she broke into mine as I left it on the couch, sort of thing. I went on Twitter to message some boy. Boy, so I thought, screw this, this, I don't even use it. <laughs> Tomorrow, 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 I, and she's not, I, I'm not going to try to get some messages as strange teenage boy, boy, I, 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 I was some happy, some happy boy band, boy band, boy band. Um, right, can we, um, Stephen, if there's anything you want to add, it would be great to um, hear from you, and then I think we can have one more question and then wind up. Okay. Huh? Oh, it's fine, let's, let's just have one more question. Okay, yeah. Uh, go on, Matt. Yeah, thanks. I was, I was quite struck by your um, description of that kind of awful abuse you suffered when you were younger. And I'd be interested to know how you feel those at the top of government really have the power to shift the dial in terms of prejudice within society more widely. So Jeremy Corbyn versus Keir Starmer or Lisa Nandy as PM, what would that look like? Um, or with, because uh, you mentioned it was with reference to a TV show. So will yeah. culture always kind of be more important and I suppose particularly as you kind of referred to there so many people now are online in echo chambers where they're not really making reference to mainstream press or mainstream politics so um yeah do you think the powers there outside of political circles to really to really change things it's a really good question um I think that and, and actually one of the things that I noticed subsequently about this um so I um a few friends of mine from school were um, became friends many years after uh, we all left school. Became friends with some of their ex-teachers on Facebook, 
Um, and one particular teacher who had actually been my form tutor in year 13 um, had, um, you know, her Facebook wasn't exactly locked down. Um, and I can't remember how I came across it, but I, I came across the fact that this person who had been my form tutor in the sixth form um, was a Chris Williamson fan. Um, now, I didn't have the kind of relationship with this form tutor to, um, for, for that to be the teacher that I went to if I was experiencing that kind of abuse. But I know that an awful lot of my peers had quite a close relationship um, you know, with her as a teacher. And um, I dread to think sort of, you know, what position a Jewish student might be in if they were the one that had to, you know, that was experiencing anti-Semitic abuse, went to their form tutor at the time, and, um, you know, and that, that was the form tutor that they were dealing with. You know, would, would that teacher tackle that, or would, um, you know, or would they um, brush it aside, or even agree with um, the people that have actually been bullying them? Um, so I think that a lot of that does come into schools and teacher training. Um, and I think also treating PSHE and citizenship, which tends to probably be one of the only areas where that gets addressed, um, as something that is far more important. I don't know about any of you guys, but my general experience of PSHE and citizenship at school was that it got 45 minutes to an hour a week yeah. um, out of you know, a six hour day, five days a week. I, I go and pay attention. Yeah, it's, it, it's, you know, PSHE and citizenship is considered a DOS. So we always considered the lesson yeah. that you mess about in for many people. I uh, teach PSHE. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm not saying it's right. And, I mean, I, I, I work as a one to one teacher of students myself now. I'm, I'm teaching it myself and trying my, um, trying my best. Uh, but, but it's, you know, it's, yeah, so I think education is a big part of it. Um, making sure that, you know, that, that is something that comes into teacher training, how to deal with, you know, tackling um, uh, bullying and how to, you know, and how to deal with particularly tackling, you know, Racist, uh, racist abuse or any kind of bigotry um, and, and tackling that and explaining to students um, whether there's been an incident or not, actually, um, but finding ways of weaving that through um, through teaching and weaving that through cross-curricularly. I don't know about the rest of the panel. Oh, sorry. Like, probably, like, the biggest jump in, like, before we get married came after we get married with people like my father. Not that story, that's the part. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that yeah, like the government and hopefully some of the late have to do a huge a huge ability to actually shape public opinion and to explain that it's far too far too led by public opinion mm -hmm. on sort of social issues, immigration, trans rights, um, policing, drug policy, things like that. And then you can take the and this is probably one of my biggest criticisms, not even with this, um, but Jeremy Corbyn's. And actually, if you like, I think they need to take an active role and actively, and I think the country will follow it. Uh, Miriam, Stephen? Um, yeah, I, I definitely think that things have obviously been much more progressive under the Labour government, things like resource policing, uh, things like, as you said, education as well. There's so many ways in which racism impacts every single day, from health services. Um, to access to welfare. I remember there was some horrible statistics about access, access to welfare amongst also also communities, I think in Greater Manchester, um, and discrimination they were facing in welfare offices um, and job centres. Um, so yeah, there's so much that a lay government can do. And I totally agree with Louisa about I think that lay party in general it, it, it should take a progressive position and stick to it and make the argument. And then that way you don't get dragged into culture wars because we just have a set position. And if the Tories want us to talk about it, they're the ones who are obsessing over it. We have a strong progressive position. Um, and that's really, really important. Um, but I'm, I'm, I also have full confidence in Starmer and I'm really excited to see what the Labour Party does. Fingers crossed in government. I don't, I don't think the politicians should get too hung up over how much influence they have over public opinion. I mean, ultimately, nothing shapes public opinion better than, than pop culture. And that, doesn't, that includes, you know, not even half the sense of the public opinion. You know, we used to decide what was and wasn't acceptable based on what you got in trouble for in the You know, that <laughs> pop, pop culture, whether that's, you know, obviously nowadays it's far more through the, the digital means of communication, but that's an old person now. But, you know, <laughs> it was, it was, it was a TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> but, really worried, though. 
Well, that's the thing because you there's a there's a pop culture that you can't control. I'm so sorry, I'm like really young. Sorry, I'm interrupting. No, it's fine. No, it's fine. But yeah, like there's so much uncensored amongst uh, young people, uncensored content on TikTok, and because of TikTok, the way it works, the algorithm shows more to see. So if you open up my feed, it's all cats um, and cooking videos. Um, but there is a huge radicalizing factor in this, so it's only ever interesting. I'm so sorry. No, no, it's fine, but it's good that you both up because it just shows you that because pop culture is so influential. When it is left to run with the mind of its own, the very little over side, it can be quite dangerous. That's, it, that's exactly it. And that's far more powerful than these politicians' opinion, but also the re because pop culture is so powerful in that regard. And you know, I, I remember changes of, of tone in, in, in LGBT rights when it came to East End of storylines or Will Young being outed. These are the things that I remember shifting the dial on that on those issues, right? As a, as a child. But as politicians, you shouldn't be chasing public opinion because you will never ever stop running, right? It's just like a football match. If you're always chasing the ball, you've got no possession, you know you're never gonna win, you're just trying to save yourself, right? And it's gonna end up embarrassing. But ultimately, if you've got a strategy, right, and you're going in the middle and you actually attempt to strike and start a formation, whether or not you win or lose the match, you can do so with dignity and with pride and know that ultimately you went in with an ambition to win, to set the agenda. And you either succeed or you don't. But ultimately, your opinion on that issue is only going to make up a fraction of a percentage of the pop culture that shapes public opinion. And just like you, you, you said about chasing that idea of whether it's on innovation or other social issues, getting stuck into the culture war, it's not a culture war if you're not chasing public opinion. It's only a culture war if you do your polling, do your focus, people go, right, we need to align with these people. Because those people will change their views when the standards changes their storyline. And then what are you going to do? You're running around the field again. So set your position, stick to it, make sure that it's justifiable, it matches the values that you hold, and that you can have your entire team answer questions to the media on it with confidence. And the public will go, well, they know where they sound, that's fine. And they probably, when they go to vote, will do so on a hundred different issues, and not because of that one thing that you've actually had a consistent stance upon. Absolutely. Uh, Stephen, should we come back to you and then finish up? Yeah, so I think. Ultimately, um, you know, culture changes are about more than just what happens in Westminster, but the leader of the, of a major party and the leader of the government even more so, you know, does have a small but significant effect, right? And we, we see that with, you know, some of the, you know, the progression towards uh, greater LGBT rights uh, in the 90s and noughties, yeah. Some of that was about the new Labour government and the human rights framework it brought in. But a lot of it was about Brookside, right? A lot of it was about, you know, how artists were responding to, you know, the HIV AIDS epidemic. Was a, a lot of it was about other stuff going on, right? I mean, if you haven't, you should watch partly this brilliant film, um, you know, Brass Off, right? Which, if, if you really want to understand why the cultural mood of the country had shifted against... The conservatives by 1995 right then you have this lovable rom-com that is basically about you know how awful the tories are and how they need to be got rid of right uh so so you know the leader of the labor party cannot do that kind of stuff but i just as i do think that boris johnson becoming prime minister has made us all a bit more cynical right the the kind of mood and the culture is kind of like oh you know you know of course they're all at it etc etc um leaders can change things not least because of course and just as with economic growth, right? They set how, who, what, who owns what and how things are regulated. And that creates the conditions for different types of economic growth, right? Then how you regulate spaces like TikTok, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, does change the cultural conditions uh, as well as, as, you know, as, as other things. So, you know, we're going to see the kind of conservative attempt to do that in whatever the online harms bill ends up looking like. And I imagine there'll be some things in it which are good and lots of things about it which are less good, to put it mildly. So, uh, yeah, the, ultimately, I think it's, it's absolutely correct to say that it is always a mistake to try and go, OK, right, so uh, my, my actual position on cultural issues is this, but I need to be here because that's where the voters are, because culture is always a moving and changing thing. But also the cultural cues given out by the leader of a major political party sets the you know, helps set and shape the rest of the cultural conversation. And that in turn makes it easier if you are a party which wants to be in a liberal position on these issues, as I think the Labour Party should want to be, 
It makes it easier if you are a party which is in the liberal position on these issues, because the cultural tide is also moving with you. The fact that the kind of the Labour Party often seems so kind of uncertain and nervous on these issues, I think actually makes the problem harder uh, uh, for you all, because it just does mean that you don't get that useful kind of cultural backdraft, right? It's not a coincidence that the era of civil partnership was also the era of the first same-sex kiss on Doctor Who. It's not a coincidence that it was the era of the first um, gay relationship in EastEnders, right? That all happened, that all, that all fed into each other. Uh, so yeah, you should be aware of the limits of your own uh, ability to shape things, but you also shouldn't be pessimistic about the fact that you do nonetheless have a real ability to, to do it and to shape those things. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we slightly overran, so um, really apologies to um, other people in the room that wanted to ask questions. Uh, I think we are going to head next door shortly, so those of you in the room, we can continue to discuss this. Um, but thank you so much to our incredible panel. Uh, it's completely a round of applause. Uh, I also just say, if you do press as well to um, Leon, the inaugural chair of uh, the Opening Fair.